Bible with you, you can turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke 14. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. There is no higher command or calling in the history of the world than what God requires in those words. Back in Luke 10, Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, and this one from Deuteronomy 6 that I just read is the one He gave. The last section of Luke 14 this morning usually focuses its discussion on what was said here. Now, not that there's anything wrong with that uh, or with that approach per se, but what if more importantly, or at least for the sake of our proper understanding before we try to interpret, is not what was said, but who said it. It sounds very much like Jesus requires the same devotion God requires if we would be obedient to Him, actually obedient to Him. And if that's the case, we must do what He says because Jesus is hereby claiming to be God in human flesh, demanding the same love the Father required of all of us in the law. Which begs the question that Israel couldn't do this. So who is really up to the task of following Jesus to the cross, the way that He requires this devotion. When Joshua called Old Covenant Israel to this kind of wholesale devotion, choose you this day whom you will serve, right? He then told them flat out, you can't serve God like He requires, and you won't serve God like He requires. You'll go astray. You'll follow after other gods. And this is the same thing Jesus requires of all those who would follow Him. Complete, utter devotion. Who is really up to the task of serving a God so holy, who is worth, worthy of so much, the most, the best of all that we have? Are you sure you want to try this? As God, Jesus calls us to die to ourselves in complete devotion to Him alone for our salvation. Let me pray. Father, I thank You for Your Word this day. God, I thank You for Your truth. And I pray that that is what You would help me preach, Your Word, what Your Son said, what Your Son meant, as closely as we can get, Father, in our own understanding, but illuminated by the power of Your Holy Spirit. So be with me, O God. Watch over all who hear and who have come to hear. May we all listen and believe our Lord Jesus, who is also our Savior. We ask and pray these things in His name. Amen. Verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him. And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now once again, we have to ask Jesus, what are you doing? Great crowds accompanied him. He's got them. They're listening. They want to follow. So, all right, Jesus, we've been having a lot of problems lately with people getting mad about what you say. There are eyes on you. They're looking to trap you. So just don't blow it. Don't say anything too crazy. Just keep it together. Now's not the time for that. If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. It's not how you keep a crowd. right? It's, it's, it's almost like Jesus is determined to upset people, and not just his critics. He even says things like this to his friends, to his disciples. His calling here goes way beyond radical. When you hear Christians talk about 
radically following Jesus, they, they're not doing what they say that means. Like nobody follows that radically. Hate. Jesus wants us to hate our own fathers and mothers and wives and children and brothers and sisters, even our own lives. I think two things are going on here that we have to keep in mind as we work our way through this passage. First, Jesus has already laid out some teaching about there are going to be people that think they're getting in that are not getting in to his great banquet, the messianic banquet at the end of all things. We already know that those who look to their own accomplishments and effort and works and status will be left out. They won't taste his banquet. That's verse 24. So we need to remember that as we consider what it means now in light of that to count the cost. There's a lot more involved in the cost than we might naturally think. To carry our crosses and renounce all that we have might mean more than we would normally think it means if we were defining what it meant to do such a thing. Context would seem to be saying part of what needs to be renounced as all that we have and cling to is our own belief in ourselves that we can actually do what Jesus is requiring. But we also know that elsewhere, Jesus and Scripture teach very clearly right, that we are to love our wives. Husbands, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, for example, we're to love our neighbors as ourselves. We're not to harm ourselves willingly, but care for and be good stewards of our own lives and our own bodies. So clearly, Jesus means something other than hate like you should despise and want to kill them in your heart, which is how he defines hatred elsewhere. But here's the thing. Even if Jesus means something like you must love them less than me, which is a good study of this word for hate here and its usage will show. Normally what is meant when he uses this form of it is contrast between two things or preference between two things. Even if he means love less than me, which I think he does, that still doesn't lessen how offensive a thing it is to demand. Especially in a society where honoring your parents was considered one of the greatest moral obligations people had. And your own family was usually considered your greatest joy. In Jewish tradition, only God openly commanded this kind of wholesale devotion that Jesus lays claim to here. So who gave Jesus the right to talk this way? Who does he think he is? This text is a claim to deity. Jesus is reminding them, He is proclaiming that He is God in human flesh. This man is also God, and He's going to also have to be our Savior. There isn't going to be another way. So humanity is faced yet again with a divine demand we cannot keep. Jesus is on His way to Jerusalem to die, specifically on a cross. Look at verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me. And where is he going? To the cross. He cannot be my disciple. You only bear a cross in preparation for your own crucifixion, for your own death. You don't just carry it around. Is Jesus saying to these Israelites that to follow him means they'll have the same destiny as he does? That following Jesus means my own death here? Yes, it's exactly what he means. So Jesus wants them to count the cost in verses 28 to 30 before they agree to such wholesale devotion. There's no casual following of Jesus. There's no complimentary association with him. One doesn't invest in something massive without considering whether it can be paid for or you'll be mocked as a fool when you can't finish it. In verses 31 to 32, Jesus brings up another example of this, of a king who realizes he needs to ask for peace instead of going to war since he doesn't have what he needs to fight. And so you see what Jesus is doing here. He's warning them that they may not have what it takes to do what he commands. And if we're all honest with ourselves, there's no maybe about it. Verse 33, so therefore any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. That's really the point of what Jesus is saying in this section. Those who would be his disciples, his followers, lifelong learners of Jesus must renounce all that they have. You'd have to be certifiably insane to take him up on this offer. I can do that, Jesus. All right, I'll do it. 
we'll say this we'll, we'll this we'll use this text to threaten others about the genuineness of their salvation also right you have to take up your cross you can't be half-hearted okay are you are you currently renouncing all that you have to the level that Jesus requires? Do you believe that if Jesus were to examine your life, he would say, you meet the mark, you are renouncing all that you have, you successfully love me more than all these other people, you are dying daily, you're taking up your cross, you're following me without exception every single day because that is what Jesus is requiring here. Well, Tony, so what are you saying? That Jesus doesn't mean what he's saying? Oh, no, beloved. He means exactly what he's saying. You have to follow like this or you cannot be his disciple. And I doubt that anyone in here would say they follow Jesus that hard, that well. Verse 34, salt is good. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. All Jesus is saying here to follow up on this is that, listen, salt is good, right? It's a good thing. It has many uses, but if it isn't salty, it's useless. It's a, it's a pointless mineral. The disciples of Jesus should be useful, and usefulness here is tied to what he's just required of all of them. That's what it means to be salty. It means to be useful. And apparently disciples that haven't renounced all they have aren't disciples at all. They're useless. There are echoes of chapter 9 in this passage in the parable of the sower and the soils. That the seed doesn't take root in most soils. Whether it's the cares of this life or temptations or suffering and trials, they reveal the ground where the seed was sown to be unfit for it. So, it can't grow. And that's where most people are in relation to Jesus. So what makes us salty as believers, as disciples? What makes a disciple useful? We were called to die to ourselves, to love our neighbors, to serve and uphold and uplift and bear one another's burdens. And no problem, right? Because when you're struggling with all your own stuff and your own problems just in your immediate circle, it's very easy to then go out and love and serve others as yourself. And so it's not... Right? You understand what I'm saying, right? Every follower of Jesus wants to do good works and please God. Every follower of Jesus wants to be this kind of disciple, right? But if we honestly put up our own record against the kind of devotion Jesus is calling for here, who among us would say we're hitting the mark consistently? Again, I don't think I doubt anybody in here or any other room believes they follow Jesus with this much devotion. So what are we supposed to do with a text like this? I think, once again, the immediate context is extremely important, but it's not like it'll get us off the hook. Jesus is literally on his way to the cross to die for our salvation in Jerusalem. So if he talks about bearing your own cross, there's a very vivid picture for those following him or desiring to follow him to look at in these days. To say that's what he means by cross. They would attach their cross to his in their minds. Jesus means we have to go die with him in Jerusalem. That's the extent of what he's calling for. That's not exactly what Jesus meant, is it? Beloved, what's, what's included in all that we have? That is, what's included in what Jesus says we must renounce. Because we don't just have love for our families and concern for our possessions. We don't just fear death and pain for ourselves. If we take all that Jesus has been saying to get to this passage, to get to this call to die, the main thing we apparently need to be renouncing that we refuse to let go of is our confidence in ourselves to be able to serve God as He is worthy of being served. Because what we'll do is we'll soften it. We'll say, well, at least I'm trying. That's not what God calls us to. If we want to attach the bearing of our cross to that of His cross, which is what Jesus is saying here, we have to remember two things. The first is heavy. 
The second is comforting. Comforting. We need to get honest, first of all, about what a cross is. Right? A cross is not a metaphor for mere difficulties and inconveniences in life. We talked about this way back when we were in chapter 9, that we all have our cross to bear, right? Self-discipline is not the way to salvation. It doesn't accompany grace. No matter how serious about it we might be, no matter how much we might give away or deny ourselves, Jesus doesn't teach two ways of salvation. He doesn't teach grace and, grace plus self-denial, but Jesus does call us to take up our crosses daily in 923, meaning not just that we practice self-denial, loving Him more than other loves. Another religious group in Israel that doesn't appear in the biblical text by name are the Essenes or the Essens, and they made commitments like that. They had tons of commitments like that. Why weren't they accepted by Jesus? Buddhists, Hindus, they all make commitments like that. Jesus means something even more radical than that. That we must follow Him as dead people. We must reckon ourselves as dead to ourselves. Dead people can't perform the righteousness God requires. This is the cross we are called to bear in 1427 that He first called us to in 923 with a daily dying to ourselves. We must reckon ourselves as dead to us but alive in Christ. Paul tells us in Romans 6.3 that we've been baptized into Christ's death. In Galatians 2.20 that we are in fact crucified with Christ. It did happen. It's no longer we who are living, but Christ who lives within us. We are being called here to let Jesus be our life before God rather than ourselves. Because if we're following Him on the road to Calvary, if that's where we're going with Jesus, what happens once we get to the actual hill? What happens there? Do we also get crucified for our sin? Do we also pay the penalty not just for our sin, but for our lack of righteousness? Are, are we going to pay the penalty there for our increasing accumulation of meager obediences and shortcomings to Him? Is that going to happen to us when we get there carrying our crosses with Jesus? No. No, it won't. And it didn't. Going to the cross with Jesus means dying to any belief we have that we can save ourselves and putting all of our sin and all of our failures to be righteous on Him so that He may take all that on Himself and atone for them so that His righteousness will be credited to as our own. And there I no longer hear commands as threats, but as a child of God by grace through faith in Him. Let all of it, all that we have, all that we are, be crucified there on Calvary with Jesus. Well, think about it. We aren't following Jesus today to His death. He already died His death. We must reckon ourselves in the same way they did then as to dying with Him there. And to be dead, to die, means everything is given away and placed on Him. And this is the hardest death for us to die and why our lives must be lives of constant repentance. For we will daily fail to miss the mark even on our best days. I believe this is first and foremost the call to believe in and cling to Jesus for every last ounce of our salvation, dying to even the slightest notion that we could contribute anything but our own death. Not even by the good works to which we are indeed called. Jesus Christ is most worthy of all our devotion, all our worship, all our service. More worthy of our whole lives than our families, our jobs, our hobbies, our nation. He is most worthy. And the day may come that we would literally have to choose between Jesus and our family or between our jobs and our lives and Jesus someday. When push comes to shove and a decision has to be made, our identity is rooted in Christ more than it is in our families or our careers or our nationalities or our countries. If we're sure we would never betray, that that would never be us, we need to stop now and repent 
we're not dying. We're trying to live. Repent. Let the one who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. It's better to think you'll fall than Jesus will be holding you up instead of your own strength. If we're in this moment trying to pump up ourselves to be ready to stand with Jesus when the time comes, we've missed the point of this passage. To this also we must die daily. I'm not living anymore. Christ is living within me. And I must let Him take the lead and be not just my forgiveness, but all my righteousness. We'll be tempted to put our trust in ourselves and find our identity with Jesus rooted in our own efforts and works every day. That's part of the old Adam in us. Satan's still trying to lead us away. Did God really say, Jesus has to do everything for me? You don't want to take advantage of God's grace, do you? I mean, did God really say it's full and free? Did God really say that you're, did He mean it when He said you're justified by, not by the law, but by grace through faith? Like, did He mean that as good as it sounds? That's not just you, that's the enemy talking to you like that. Getting you to do what He's always done. Just doubt the Word a little bit. All our failures to properly and fully take seriously the nature of Jesus' call into this new family to carry our crosses and renounce our possessions have to be taken to Calvary so that there they may be crucified with Him. And there, by hiding ourselves in His wounds, we're raised to a new life, away from obedience to these demands as our hope of life or to be His disciple. We must die first of all, or first to all we would do or fail to do, and ask Jesus to live through us by the power of His Holy Spirit in us as He conforms us into His image by the power of His grace. This is the call of Jesus. Come and die and live in me. And that call is for you. Would you stand?